Welcome. It's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Breaking down news of the day, none other than Max Burns, TYT contributor, Rebel HQ superstar. Should be an amazing breakdown. Top story of the day, CDC director. Yes, the CDC director under a Democratic administration has now called black men who were illegally experimented upon, she says, well, they made a sacrifice. That's called revisionist history, madam. Let's put up her picture, full mass. We got some work and education to do. You're looking at CDC director, Rochelle Walensky. Ms. Walensky attempted to pay homage to victims of the Tuskegee experiment. It supremely backfired after she decided to proclaim that they made sacrifices for the greater good. Let's dive into why this is so offensive. The director wanted to share news about the federal uh, commemoration of the Tuskegee experiment coming to an end. This was the 50th year anniversary. A few days ago, Walensky, the director, took to social media to promote a CDC event acknowledging the end of the 40 year study that tricked over 600 black men into living with syphilis for the United States government's research. Some felt the statement was clumsy and inferred that the victims voluntarily sacrificed for the advancement of science. So here's the tweet. She tweeted and I quote, I will be joined by colleagues and public health leaders as we honor the 623 African American men, their suffering and sacrifice and our commitment to ethical research and practice. Twitter erupted with people blasting her as misrepresenting one of the nation's most horrible crimes against black people in the 20th century. Fayetteville Observer columnist Myron B. Pitts tweeted, sacrifice is not the right word. They were lied to, suffering is correct. Let's be very clear, nobody would contextualize this for other mass experiments or even mass evils visited upon a particular demographic. They would not say, well, you know, they made a sacrifice for the greater good. The contextualization is 100% off. It is wrong. Miss Walensky, this is not something we should play with, right? Well, it's interesting because you had an opportunity to apologize. It was presented to you. People said they were offended. Even some of your own colleagues went on social media. They went on Twitter and they responded directly to you. Instead of apologizing, you decided to double down on your statement with a miss clarification. All right, so Walensky did not take down her tweet. Had an opportunity, chose not to. But she posted a follow up message instead saying, and I quote, I joined many to reflect on the untreated syphilis study at Tuskegee. We honored the 623 African American men who were subjects of the study and acknowledged their pain and that of their families, she wrote. Their legacy lives on today and their stories and history must never be forgotten. Uh, that's a miss, swing and a miss. Let's do this, let's intentionally demonize the criminals who engaged in this 40 year study. Let's do that, let's call them for who they are. They are criminals, they are adversarial to common decency in medical science, and they should be mentioned as such. But you did not do that, there's more. The Macon County, Alabama men in this experiment were never told they were not being treated for their conditions, but were actually under watch for scientists to study the progression of syphilis and STI. The website states the study initially involved 600 black men, 399 with syphilis, 201 did not have the disease. However, in the end, more men were included. They never consented, they never consented to this study. 
They never consented to the research to be conducted and data collected as the men were told they were being treated for bad blood. The government offered the men free medical exams, free meals and burial insurance to participate in the study for 40 years, ranging from 1932 to 1972. After a whistleblower leaked that the men were unaware, according to Newsweek, 40 years. See, that's the part. For 40 years, individuals with medical degrees, for 40 years, people who took an oath to do no harm, 40 years, they engaged in this kind of experimentation against black men. But it wasn't only against black men. Don't stop the story there, madam. It goes deeper. Who else did they experiment on by extension? Well, the wives of these men. And also the children, let's get into it. To complicate Walensky's comment by the country's commitment to ethical research and practice. Penicillin, a drug used to treat syphilis, became available and was widely used by 1943. But researchers refused to administer the cure to the very black man that gave it to them. Refused to administer the cure to those in the study, even to those whose health went in decline because of the disease. Informed consent in medical studies is one of the enduring legacies of the Tuskegee criminal experiment. So look at the insanity beyond the criminality. The black men experimented upon, their families have to endure this, they are lied to, and then there's a cure. Well, common sense would say, okay, well, at least they deserve the cure were the ones that infected them. No, they decided to let them die. Yes, some of them actually died from the disease that was put inside of their bodies by our government. Many say this study, the extraction of miracle cells from Henrietta Lacks and the practices of women during slavery to further the gynecological research are but a few reasons why black people remain distrustful of American medical practices. A psychological stain that stops many from going to doctors for health checkups, wellness concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, why is this imperative to highlight in its proper context? Remember when COVID first hit, it's a lot of rumor, misinformation. And some people cannot understand why individuals, especially in the African American community, were so, let's say, hesitant about the shot, the vaccination. Well, there was a reason. Even though I disagree with the conclusion of that particular sentiment, I understood the why. The why was important. This is part of the why. Even after it has been well documented, even after criminality has been well established and the victims are understood for who they were, victims, true victims. There's a revisionist history even now. The Equal Justice Initiative said 128 participants died of syphilis or related complications. It was also revealed 40, count that, 40 of their wives were infected with the disease. And 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. All of this has been maintained in CDC records and was stopped because of an AP journalist, Gene Heller, who broke the story and shook the medical world, July 25th, 1972. Madam Director, if you're gonna tell the story, damn it, tell the whole story. If it had not been for the whistleblower and that journalist at the AP, either A, you would still be doing something like this as an agency, or B, never would have told them or the American public what went down. Please exercise a level of decency 
as it relates to one of the worst medical tragedies visited upon black folk in this country. And apologize for how you decided to contextualize this matter. A sacrifice is a willing commitment. What they went through was a criminal act. All right, Max thoughts here. I think Dr. Walensky has said some thoughtless stuff before, but this is really to me an object lesson that a lot of smart people with all of these resources available to us today. And they know a lot of the facts of Tuskegee, but they're still missing the meaning of why it matters, why this was so wrong. I mean, this was, as you said, no voluntary sacrifice. This was human experimentation, a human rights abuse. They weren't given consent forms, they weren't given knowledge of what was happening. And this destroyed generations of black families. And there is still, you know, with this, with this Walensky's words, an acknowledgement of the cold facts, but not of the actual reality of what this cost our country and what this cost these families. And there's still clearly a lot of learning that needs to be done. Yeah, and for context, Bill Clinton, when he was president, he apologized on behalf of the country and the CDC. But the reality is, we have to not only honor the memory in the right way, we have to contextualize the criminals in the proper way as well. All right. Minors being searched illegally is called a cavity search when they actually go inside of your body. It's good against the law. We now have another update. Let me put the screenshot up for mass, the picture here. I'm not sure on the video. Indisputable received exclusive video footage from Aurora police. This was from Illinois resident Ronald Cooper. Mr. Cooper showed the Aurora police officer illegally performing what's called a body cavity search on an African American minor. Now, understand this, it is illegal to engage in a body cavity search of an adult and a minor without a significant amount of protocol already being established. None of that was established. After the video went viral, Indisputable learned the person in the video was not a man, but a 17 year old kid. We reported on that first, here's what we learned. The teen graduated from high school about a week ago. He is in fact disabled, plays the keyboard and wants to be a professional musician. He drove to Aurora, Illinois on November 12th to record music with high school friends inside of a studio. As they left the music studio to return home, police stopped them on the street and searched them. A witness says the gang unit surveilled the teens for half an hour. The gang unit was present, reported they smelled marijuana. The drug is fully legal for adults in the state. They issued a citation to the teenager for possession of an adult use cannabis in a of adult use cannabis in a motor vehicle. The man who filmed the incident said he watched police on the street profiling the teens for more than half an hour. He alleges it was a pretextual stop. Now remember these kinds of stops, they are becoming illegal in many regions throughout the country. Now there's more, his mother, her name is Janetta Jameson. She spoke to indisputable outraged about what happened. This is the direct quote, for this to go on is criminal. These police do what they want to do. And it's about time somebody got on them. They said he was trying to buy weed or smoke weed and said, you have to come to the police station to pick him up. When I showed up, nobody, no nothing, she says. Nobody will speak to me. Y'all didn't tell me about how they put their hands on him. They did all that to him in front of the whole world. That is not acceptable. And then they lied to me about what what occurred. Let me put up one of the cops, okay? Here's the officer who did the illegal frisk of the teenager according to the eyewitness. His name is Officer Hennings. Let's put up a picture of the witness, Mr. Cooper. Okay, Cooper 
says he actually films the police on a regular basis. Why? Because they performed a body cavity search on him in 2021 in public. So he took that kind of embarrassment. He took that moment in his life and he transformed it into an opportunity to serve. He became an advocate. I'm just doing this for my nephews. I don't want the same thing to happen to them, he said. I've been standing out here 20 plus years. This happens all the time. Let's go to the report he filed when this happened. Cooper filed a complaint. That's what you're supposed to do, create a paper trail. He filed a complaint after he witnessed the incident on November 12th. The complaint read in part, when I observed Officer Hennings move his hands up his anal cavity and personal private parts, the other officers continued to hold him while Officer Hennings molested this young man. Let's go to the law 103-1 of Illinois. This is what the law says, no search of any body cavity other than the mouth shall be conducted without a duly executed search warrant. The rules are even more restrictive for minors. Here's the police chief, his name is Keith, Keith Cross and Kane County DA, Jamie Mosser. Initially, the Aurora police completely dismissed Mr. Cooper's complaint. Sent an email, basically said, "Oh, I don't really know what happened. Um, I just know the gang unit was there. And if they were there, they had a reason to be there. And you and I see things differently. That was basically the response from the police chief when the complaint was logged. But Lieutenant Ted Groans stated his department is now investigating after our reporting. They have not updated Mr. Cooper yet. Um, the DA also said her team is now investigating this incident. And let me provide the appropriate context. According to the narrative, this is not a one off. This has happened multiple times to multiple black men, specifically black minors. So while it's good that they're investigating the one, let's make sure we stay on them to investigate it all, all right? Max thoughts here. This story to me is just more evidence that the impunity, I think that empowered the abuse at Tuskegee is still with us. I mean, we are still routinely mm. seeing government officials like this violating the bodily autonomy of black Americans, disabled Americans, without any concern, without any fear in the open air in public. And when they're called on it, when they're told the laws they're violating, they shrug it off as being irrelevant. And the fact is that police feel so comfortable doing this because they've been able to do it for so long. And I, I mean, my incredible thanks to people who are recording these officers and finally bringing some evidence of this forward and making it somewhat harder to break the law so freely and without any fear of consequence. Very well said, we're gonna stay on top of it until a full and exhaustive investigation is done for all the incidents we know on record. Police officers showing their true colors. One wears a uh, wears Trump gear to a Black Lives Matter rally. The other one gives a white supremacist a high five. Yeah, okay. Um, so a New York Police Department sergeant. Let's put a picture of full mask. Well, she decided to wear pro-Trump patches on her uniform. Yeah, on her uniform and blew kisses at protesters during a Black Lives Matter protest. Well, finally, this cop has been suspended, but only for 10 days. And they docked her pay for 30 vacation days. Yes, that's what you get for being a racist individual contrary to the rules laid out in front of you. The sergeant's name is Dana Martilio. Now, you see the patches, right? You're looking at them. That's on her official uniform. You mean to tell me nobody saw this? 
You mean to tell me that nobody saw this when her shift started? You mean to tell me nobody saw this when she was riding to the protest? You mean to tell me the supervisor did not see this before the protest? Also, I do not believe this was her first time wearing these patches. Look at this, on an official police uniform, all right? Okay, so the sergeant was caught on video wearing these two patches. One with the Punisher skull logo and Trump style hair. And a second with a similar image and the words Trump 2020 and make enforcement great again. Video from the demonstration in front of the 84th precinct station house in downtown Brooklyn showed the sergeant pull down her mask and blow a kiss at protesters. After they asked why she was at the Capitol or if she was at the Capitol on January 6th and called her a domestic terrorist. At her departmental trial, Inspector Matthew Gallivan testified that he pointed out the patches that day. And when she asked, am I going to get in trouble for it? He responded, you're not going to be in trouble. Just zip the jacket up, according to Gamble's report. The sergeant meanwhile testified that Galvin made no such order. Instead telling her, no, I like your patches. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that that's exactly what happened. The other officer said, you know what, it's cool, I like those patches. You know why? Because if there's insubordination, you can simply have her removed. She's a police officer who is there under your leadership. So if she decides not to do what you have told her to do, why is she still there for the entire protest? Okay, there's more. She also contended that the patches, now check this out, that the patches were not political because Trump is no longer a candidate. The kiss blowing and remarks at the protest, according to her, were an attempt to diffuse a tense confrontation. She said at the trial, uh, Murray also pointed out, this is the uh, lawyer, uh, to the former president's visit to the 17th precinct station house on September 11, 2021 as proof of a double standard at play. He was invited in by great fanfare and celebration by high ranking members of the department. He was invited behind the desk to sign the book. He said, he's a civilian, loves the police. It's permissible to celebrate Trump, he's a civilian. I'll be damned, but isn't that something? Well, here's the thing, if that's how it works, all right? I need some police officers to put on some indisputable gear and see what that'll do in your department, okay? Let's test the theory here. I'm a private citizen, I've never even run for political office. So I must be safe for you to put my picture on your uniform, right? Now we know good and damn well that would never fly. But for some reason, they are at least partly allowing it, the NYPD. Now that may boil your blood. You see exactly what she was doing, all right? She was being antagonistic, unprofessional, and she gets a slap on the wrist. She will continue and at some point, she will contribute to defunding the police. Because I guarantee you, there will be an adverse action in her police career. There's another cop, Columbus, he decides to high five a white supremacist. Here it is. Who said you high five these guys? What's that? Who said you high five these guys? Yes. Seriously, what's that all about? Build relationships with fascists. Really? Well, I'm not supporting their cause. I'm connecting with them. I'm not here hanging out with them. I'm not. I'm not here to support their cause. I'm here to support the right to protest. We were talking about my mustache. The guy said I had a good mustache. That's all it is. I do not. I am. You can ask. I am very clear. I'm not supporting their cause. I'm supporting their right to protest. I'm glad I came to you. And you can you can request my body worn camera and you can watch the whole thing. There's nothing I'm not I'm doing that's I'm not I, I can see the optics of it looking exactly. that way. Exactly, it did look that way. 
way. Just like when we're at a homicide scene and somebody makes a joke, we try not to laugh because, you know, it looks like we're laughing at this. But, right, exactly. But, no. But, I mean, I hope they're telling me the truth. That, oh, you know what I mean? You know? My name is Steve Dyer. I am uh, the leader of this of the dialogue team. My goal is to facilitate people's right to protest. I am starting this because I think it's everybody's right to protest. Yeah, he got caught. He got caught and he was trying to talk himself out of what another person witnessed. Here's the thing, I've literally seen at a Black Lives Matter protest, a young African American male leader extend his hand to a cop. The cop told him, I cannot shake your hand, it is a security risk, but I can listen to you talk. You see, different rules for different groups obviously. A few years ago, the Department of Justice released a report. You can find it online right now. The report said the greatest domestic threat in the United States of America at that time was not simply white supremacist groups. It was white supremacists infiltrating law enforcement. They already had the information. They knew then this would be a great risk moving forward. Did anybody, did anybody stop it? No, was there legislation? to stop it. No, it continued. And now here we are. Max, what are your thoughts on this? I like your idea. I think you should send a whole box of indisputable patches to the NYPD and and see how many people wear them. There you go. I mean, the fact is these Punisher logos are well known images on the far right. We saw them on January 6th, we saw them at Charlottesville. The people wearing them know full well what they mean and, and what they inspire. And what they inspire is fear. And it's the same with this officer who says, I'm not friends with these far right neo Nazis. I'm just hanging out with them. And the fact is, they feel like they can play by a separate set of rules. And your concern as a citizen for whether they may be biased or not doesn't matter to them. And there's really no meaningful consequences they'll pay for that. So until that sort of structure comes into place where this is actually. Uh, given some kind of serious consequence, we'll see it continue to grow. Yeah, I agree 100%. Once again, no legislation for this, but legislation for fictional issues like critical race theory. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Always good to be with you. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Before I do that, reminder, tomorrow we have the Senate, US Senate runoff from the state of Georgia, Senator Raphael Warnock and Herschel Burchill, AKA Herschel Walker, okay? Uh, this is just amazing. Um, uh, will Georgia choose Senator Raphael Warnock or Walker? Find out, Jank, me, John, we're gonna be here. Make sure you tune in, tyt.com forward slash live, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. And you can tune in on Samsung TV Plus, Roku, Zumo, Pluto TV, TCL, Fubo TV, and Local Now. That's tomorrow, all right? We'll provide that live coverage. All right, good comments. Uh, Stop Dragon says, the government's instinct to minimize truth for the sake of potential damage to America's historical prestige is part of the reason this country has torn itself apart. The Tuskegee tragedy should forever be acknowledged as such. Very well said. I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a In Sunday? You're going to feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's a cop. Just step away from this. This is unproductive. Not only that, regardless of how rowdy my sister in law is getting, she should not be talking to the customers that way. That's how Starbucks is representing Starbucks, and I will no longer buy from Starbucks then. But like I said, I wasn't disrespecting her. I wasn't getting out nothing. But once you disrespect my 10 year old daughter, regardless of how my 10 year old daughter's acting, that's when I got a problem. And like I said, if she's gonna disrespect my 10 year old daughter, then she can take her ass outside so I can whoop her ass. And I'm not playing. Okay. Yeah, she needs to be recommended for the way she's acting. I, 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 I speak with her. I don't, I obviously was not here to see what I want her name. I want her name. Miss Hannah. I uh, yeah, this is really interesting. Okay, uh, let's put up the picture here for mass. There's a mom Karen, all right, and looks to be an aunt Karen, who clearly are great influences 
on the daughter slash niece, Karen. Okay, uh, this went down. It was a Starbucks, but it was one of the kiosk things they have, uh, and it was over, you know, an order. So the barista was being accosted by this particular Karen. Now let me say this for the record, okay? Sometimes orders do not get done properly. I used to work in fast food personally. I made some mistakes myself. I worked as a waiter before, made some mistakes. Mistakes happen. Just because mistakes happen, it does not give you the license to act in such a manner. Let's be clear about mistakes. We all make them as part of the human experience. There is no such thing as perfection for a human being. When you make a mistake, madam, do you want someone to talk to you the way you decided to interact here? Of course not, it's not how this works. Now, people can wax poetic about how the barista could have handled it differently. And maybe that's true on some level, but let's keep it 100. Individuals who work to serve us in these particular um, restaurants and coffee shops, they deserve, I dare say, the benefit of the doubt. Everybody's entitled to a bad day, everybody's entitled to a mistake, it happens, all right? Threatening to physically harm somebody, that's a no-no. It will land you on this show every time. All right, Max, thoughts here. I think the last thing this person needs is more caffeine. I mean, she seems to be quite pumped up already. And it, it's just shocking to me, the people who yell the loudest about wanting to be respected are the ones who are least willing to give respect to anybody else. They'll mm. scream, they'll swear at you, they'll ask for you to be fired. I mean, I think if, if this is a problem, then the way this 10 year old kid is acting, maybe the parent should talk to her kid instead of screaming at someone who's just trying to do a job and make a paycheck. You know, it is the priorities are so off and you just hope this kid grows up and does not uh, attach on to those influences because they are toxic. Yeah. The New York mayor is doing something that I think is very dangerous. Um, he has a plan, I don't know how well thought out it is. Here's what Mayor Eric Adams is doing when it comes to, well, the homeless and the mentally ill. The New York mayor is facing criticism for a controversial program. It allows local police and emergency medical workers to involuntarily hospitalize citizens who appear to be mentally ill, appear. This has predominantly impacted the homeless community. The directive, which Adams announced on Tuesday, also allows authorities to remove anyone who displays an inability to meet basic living needs, including untreated injuries, unawareness of their surroundings and their physical condition. Even if officials have not observed they, them rather commit a recent dangerous act. Officers can take them into custody, send them to local hospitals for a psychiatric evaluation. That according to a statement from Adams office. The mayor's plan comes at the end of the year in which random attacks in the subways and streets, many of them attributed to homeless people with mental illness, have put many New Yorkers on edge. Mr. Adams and Governor Kathy Hockel have both rolled out numerous programs to address the issue, including adding outreach teams and clearing encampments to try to convince people to move to shelters. The governor has agreed to add 50 more beds to psychiatric wards in the city. New York City currently has at least 3,400 people living on the streets and subways. As of Monday, more than 64,000 people are living in New York City shelters. Critics argue that this new directive could potentially be a violation of individual civil liberties and using police as auxiliary social workers could be incredibly harmful to those involved. The Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled and Advocacy Group said involuntary hospitalization constituted discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That from Andy Newman and Emma G. Fitzsimmons from the New York Times. Just because someone smells, because they haven't had a shower for weeks, because they're mumbling, because their clothes are disheveled, that doesn't mean they're danger to themselves or others, said Norman Siegel, the former head of the New York Civil Liberties Union and co-founder of a volunteer outreach program, the Street 
Homeless Advocacy Project. And they're going to have the cops of all people make those decisions. Jermaine Williams, the city's public advocate and some other Democratic elected officials have raised concerns about police officers evaluating people on the streets and the lack of details on what care people will receive once they are removed. That's a major red flag right there, Mr. Williams said. Mr. Williams said that while he was glad that Mr. Adams was committed to helping people with severe mental illness, he worried that black men would be disproportionately affected by the new policy and that people would be turned away from overburdened hospitals. He said that the city should focus on funding less intrusive programs like homeless drop in centers where people can get a hot meal and a shower and mental health urgent care centers. This disturbs me on so many levels, Ray, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. What concerns you the most here? Yeah, I work for a center for independent living here in Chicago. So we do disability rights advocacy. I represent disabled people in civil rights cases. Um, so I think primarily the most concerning thing here is the violation of the civil liberties of these individuals. And even if someone is swept up in this program who isn't disabled, the ADA covers individuals who are regarded as having a disability. So they would be covered under this act. So not just all of the people who do have mental illnesses who are being swept up by the police, but the people who are swept up by the police simply because they are perceived as having a disability. Um, I think that the solution to this issue is to give houses to these homeless individuals, provide outlets for which they can get psychiatric care. But part of my, my work is to prevent people from being forced into these congregate living facilities, from being relegated into these um, hospitals, which often don't have the resources or ability to meet the needs of every individualized patient, especially if you're overflowing them with uh, individuals who also don't have, probably don't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. So even if you get them diagnoses, it doesn't help them moving forward if they don't have a place, a doctor they can regularly meet with or a safe place to live at the end of the day. Yeah. It's really just a program that's being put in place to to help people not have to see homelessness so that they feel less cycle. uncomfortable. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's really disgusting. And I'm glad you're raising the alarm on this because it's so concerning. Yeah, it is and it's something we're gonna have to continue to watch it, including how police are gonna Round people up and and put them, I guess, on a, on a psychiatric hold is what they really could do, and they're not able to escape that. All right, what if I told you a school system was still engaged in actual racial discrimination, where white children have to be in a particular classroom and black children have to be in the other? Well, we brought you this story. In 2021, now that school is being investigated by the federal government. Let's put up the picture full mass, it's in the city of Atlanta. Atlanta Public Schools, they are now being investigated for allegedly placing black kids in classrooms according to their race. On November 14th, a complaint letter was sent to Atlanta Public Schools alleging that a principal assigned black students to second and third grade classes according to their race during 2019 all the way until 2021. That is when we first reported on this. The Atlanta Journal Constitution, the AJC reports that a parent who is black made the complaint against Mary Lynn Elementary School in Calla Park. The complaint alleges that about 13 black students were put into two classes while white students were placed in any of the six second grade classes. Now remember, this is a majority white elementary school. Now for the shocker, put up the principal. See there, look at that. Sharon Briscoe, principal of Mary Lynn Elementary School. According to the report, a school administrator allegedly admitted to the complaining parent that Principal Briscoe separated the students so they would not be the only black children in the class. That is the excuse she gave. Now, here's what the school is saying, a direct quote from the institution. Atlanta Public Schools told Axios in a statement. This is 
following the federal complaint process. Said the report, the district added in its statement, given that this matter is pending before a federal administrative agency for consideration, APS has no further comment. You really didn't comment before the investigation. You didn't comment really in 2021 when we first did the story. And so now you're saying, well, we can't comment because it's a federal investigation. There's more background on the law. There's an actual law that must be followed on segregation and why it exists today. While explicit decisions to group or separate children based on race are illegal. Segregation persists in schools throughout the country. Often because the neighborhoods the schools enroll children from are themselves segregated. A series of court decisions over the years have gradually outlawed most of the civil rights movement era methods schools have used to make sure every child had fair process for school enrollment regardless of race. Now, how did this happen? How did it become a story in 2021? Well, ironically, a parent complained and said, you know, I would like my child to be in a particular classroom. This is not abnormal. This is actually a pretty common request. Parents make requests all the time based on what they've heard about a particular teacher or a better fit with an educator. So the request was made. According to the parents, that request was denied because the child was black. And the request was to put the child in a class that was for whites only. Now, damn it, this is a public school system that receives public dollars from us. Meaning they are subject to the rules of civil rights. So they decide to say no to this parent. Well, the parent was a school psychologist who actually worked in that same school. So this school psychologist made an issue, filed an official complaint, and then it made the news. This was back in 2021. The attorney who's representing the family has a question. And I echo your concern. The question is, why did it take so long for them to start investigating this? All right, we'll bring you updates as they come. This should not happen to the principal. Shame on you for doing this. You know, you're probably not the only one, okay? And if you're not, listen, email me. I'm happy to expose every single one of you. This is not the way it should be done, period. Max, thoughts here. The sad reality is we're gonna see more and more of this because you know this principal says she did this with the best of intentions. Hey, maybe that's true, the investigation will, will find that out. But the fact is, this is being enabled by a huge majority of right wing judges all the way up to the Supreme Court who are systematically dismantling half a century of civil rights legislation. It is easier now than 20 years ago to segregate a public school because the Republican agenda in the courts has been met with no resistance from anyone. And now we're seeing that this is what happens. We will see even more examples of even more egregious segregation unless something is done. Yeah, um, it's time out for this madness. Obviously, we have to become uh, exactly what we would like to see. If you would like to see diversity, if you want to see fairness, you're in a leadership position, you have to be that. All right, you have to be a dogmatic advocate, for what you think is right. We got more. The other side is indisputable. Stick and stay. Welcome back. Always good to be with you. Don't forget 20th year anniversary documentary. All right, we got it. 20 years fighting for positive change. And our new member exclusive short documentary. You can get an inside look at TYT as Jank, Anna, John, and JR reflect on the past, present, and future. Tune in on December 9th and become a member. If you're not, tyt.com forward slash join. Let's make that happen. I got a couple of comments, gotta be very quick. Um, Lynn says, easy to see where the 10 year old Karen learned how to be rude to those serving her. Yeah, there you go. And um, thank you for this, um, Antonio White. Welcome to Indisputable. Uh, Natural Born Keeler, been a member for five months. Says so glad to be part of this very important movement. Love of the TYT community. We love you back. All right, Herschel Dam 
Walker doesn't know what position he's actually running for. He tells people he's running for the House. No, sir, you're running for the US Senate. Also, another woman comes out against him in striking detail about his abuse. Okay, let's go to the first video, here it is. Cheryl Parsa first told her story to the Daily Beast last week, alleging the former football star physically attacked her in 2005. He told me, you wanna see a man? I'll show you a man. And he was pressing his forehead against mine. My head was against the wall. He was speaking with such force that his saliva was all over my face. And he had his hand on my throat and my chest. And then he leaned back to throw a punch. And luckily I was able to avoid that. And uh, the punch landed on the wall instead of me. I never real uh, thought that I would be in this situation today. Who would have ever thought he would be running for Senate? Um, and I would feel this compelled to come forward. Um, but it was the women, it was, it was for me because I'd lived in silence for so long, um, carrying the shame of what I allowed. It's a damn shame, this man is the Republican nominee for the United States Senate. The election is tomorrow, he's in a runoff and he could win. He is within the margin of error with all aggregate polling data. He is within the margin of error of defeating Senator Raphael Warnock. All right, President Obama came to the state of Georgia to stop for Senator Warnock. And he has some things to say about Herschel Walker. Here it is. Now, if, if you had forgotten what I said the last time, it's okay because you just have to wait a minute. He reminds you every time he opens his mouth. I mean, every day. Every day he comes up with something. Every day, since the last time I was here, <laughs> since the last time I was here, Mr. Walker has been talking about issues that are of great importance to the people of Georgia, like whether it's better to be a vampire or a werewolf. This is a debate that I must confess I once had myself. <laughs> When I was seven, <laughs> then I grew up. In case you're wondering, by the way, Mr. Walker decided he wanted to be a werewolf, which is great. As far as I'm concerned, he can be anything he wants to be, except for a United States Senator. That was in the state of Georgia, President Obama was in rare loose form. All right, I thought he was about to say, I wish a Karen would, all right? Now, Herschel Walker had this to say um, about his own candidacy. He says, and I quote, they're not less motivated because they know right now that the house will be even. So they don't want to understand what is happening right now. Walker told Politico, you get the house, you get the committees, you get all the committees even, they just stall things within there. So if we keep a check on Joe Biden, we just going to keep a check on him. Listen y'all, I did not embellish anything in what I just said to you. That was his exact damn quote. Number one, the man thinks he's running for the House of Representatives, number one. Number two, if you remember, he did an interview where he was talking about Congressman John Lewis, the late Congressman John Lewis, and he called him Senator John Lewis. So he thinks John Lewis wasn't in the House, but in the Senate. And he believes that he's running for the House um, and not the Senate. And then it gets even deeper. Uh, 
even if Walker won, it doesn't create an even split in the US Senate. So he doesn't know what he's running for. He doesn't understand math. He obviously doesn't understand politics. But why is this so damn infuriating? Because Republicans hoped that black folk in Georgia would fall for this. They knew white Republicans, especially the bigoted ones, would vote for a Herschel Walker. They knew that. As long as they validated Herschel, they would vote for Herschel because Herschel is a yes man. But the other part of their plan, so diabolical, was to make black people, this is what they wanted to do. I don't think it would be successful, but they wanted this. They wanted to make black people feel as if Herschel Walker was one of them, that he was connected to their struggle or culture, whatever it may be. This was not about having a substantive leader represent the interest of Georgia. Max, thoughts here. Well, I'll tell you, when Herschel Walker starts a sentence, Lord knows where it's gonna end. I don't even think he has any idea. There, there's this tendency to sort of look at him as this dopey idiot, which he is. But we're also seeing in a lot of these allegations, a long train of serious allegations of violence, abuse, harassment. Uh, the way he treats his own family as abusive and absentee and cruel. Uh, Georgia really has an opportunity tomorrow to make a statement about its values and what kind of state it wants to be. And I really hope that they'll bring Raphael Warnock back to the Senate and be done with this entire Herschel Walker nightmare. Yeah, um, Senator, uh, Senator Warnock, good man. I've been friends with him for many years, well before he even considered running for the US Senate. He's a great pastor at Ebenezer, been to his church many times. I've spoken at his church. And this is quite unbelievable to him too, <laughs> believe it or not. But it is what it is. So Georgia, make sure you do what you gotta do, vote. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Cray Cray Souffle says, okay, Obama was funny at this event. That's what I said too. I've seen him try to land some jokes. Sometimes he's really funny, sometimes he's not. Uh, he was in rare form. All right, and I think the all black kind of helped him nail it, right? Okay, I agree with you. A 78 holiday, talking about Walker, uh, he's gonna need a new badge. Yep, Tracy Ravenhall, please Georgia, we need a runner, not a walker. There you go. Twitch, Descendant PM, my heart goes out to the person who has to transcribe what Walker says in public. Uh, and what if his campaign executives, Came out and said that, you know, the guy is a pathological liar. You don't say. All right. Um, yeah. Really interesting. What if I told you a police chief gets pulled over and uses her badge to get out of a simple ass ticket and is all on camera and now she has resigned? Let's go to the video. Here it is. Good evening. How you doing? Good. I'm Deputy Chicago the Sheriff's Office. Stopped you because you driving tag or uh, unregistered vehicle with no tag on it on the roadway. Yeah, we were we went to the club. It was closed, so we went over and picked up some. Is your camera on? It is. I'm the police chief in Tampa. Oh, how you doing? I'm doing good. Okay. I'm hoping that you'll just let us go tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, now that you say I. Uh, you look familiar, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I do. Okay, so, all right, folks. Well, uh, have a good night. Staying over here in East Lake Woodlands. Yeah, we live we in East Lake Woodlands. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> so, I'm Deputy Jacoby. Okay. Same here, my friend. All right. Take so, care of yourself. All right. Sorry take care. To bother you. All right. No worries. No worries. Like, say, we have a lot of problem with the uh, the golf carting around here. You know, everybody. No, gets we out. don't normally come out. We but never the club come was out. Closed, we never, so we never. Went to the Greek place to get some food. And gotcha. Okay. All right. All right. Then we'll take care. And uh, it was nice meeting you. All right. <laughs> Oh, all right. If you ever need anything, call me. Okay. Serious. All right. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank so. you for your service. Thank you for yours. Thank you. Right. So, take care. All right. Take Thank care. you. Have a good night, folks. All right. Have a good night, folks. If you ever need anything, call me. All right.
So let's analyze this. Number one, it seemed as if she was bribing the man with a job or potential job opportunity. You ever need anything, call me, I'm serious, okay? She proceeded to ask a very relevant question. Is your camera on? The deputy says, well, yes it is. She still decides to say, I'm the police chief and I would prefer if you just let us go. Why did you ask him if his camera was rolling? If you were going to say that. Uh, let's put a picture up for her mass here. Um, as we were working on this story today in production, uh, we received information that the Tampa police chief, Mary O'Connor has now resigned. She resigned today as a result of that incident. O'Connor was put initially on administrative leave after that footage from the traffic stop last month revealed. She told a sheriff's deputy that she was hoping that you would just let us go tonight and showed her badge. Let me say this, okay, why is she unemployed today? She's unemployed today because of the culture of policing. This, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. See that culture allowed her to feel comfortable doing what she did. The culture allowed the deputy to feel comfortable doing what he did. Let me give you another example of a government employee where this would never work. Let's say you work for watershed management, okay? Do you think another watershed management employee is going to ignore the fact that you owe a water bill? Would never happen. Nobody would even think of something like that, all right? That would never apply. But in policing, it's a different story. And another dynamic, another point of irony of this whole thing. She gets suspended immediately. She resigned quickly because the mayor was pretty dogmatic about how this is a no no. What if the police chief would have shot an unarmed black man? Do you think she would be out of a job this quickly? Or would there be a long drawn out investigative review before a conclusion was made? Just food for thought, the mayor's office announced her resignation today saying, and I quote, Tampa Mayor Jane Castor has requested and received the resignation of Police Chief Mary O'Connor following the completion of an internal affairs investigation into a recent traffic stop involving O'Connor. Now I want to remind y'all, this just happened. Let's put up the picture of the mayor, okay? Uh, way to go, mayor, this was quick, this was fast. Uh, internal affairs obviously did this at record pace. I've had, I have never seen an investigation conclude this quickly. The mayor admonished O'Connor's actions in the statement by saying, the Tampa Police Department has a code of conduct that includes high standards for ethical and professional behavior that apply to every member of our police force. As the police chief, you're not only to abide by and enforce those standards, but to also lead by example. That clearly did not happen in this case. It is unacceptable for any public employee and especially the city's top law enforcement officer to ask for special treatment because of their position. Now, once again, if the police chief simply would have said, hey, I'm the police chief in Tampa, here's my information. She probably does not get in trouble, okay? Let's just be frank. If she simply said, here's why I work and here's my information, probably no issue. Does it still smell bad? Of course it does. But I don't think she loses her job. Once again, she feels too comfortable in that position. Both of them did, everybody, okay? There's more, the mayor recognized O'Connor's um, service contributions as police chief, including reducing, reducing violent gun crime, proactively engaging with the community and focusing on officer wellness. But these accomplishments pale in comparison to the priority I place on integrity, the mayor says in her Monday resignation letter. O'Connor wrote, she and I quote, would never want my personal mistake to stand in the way of the progress I have made in mending relationships between the police department and the community. For that reason, 
I am resigning. Uh, worth noting, in October of this year, the chief was lobbying the mayor's office to block a public vote on police oversight. So while she was an advocate for police wellness, she also was an advocate against police oversight. All right, there you have it, that's the update, that's the conclusion to the story. And I'm sure this chief will get a job somewhere else. We'll report on that too when it happens. Okay. A sheriff, an elected damn sheriff got arrested for drugs and guns. Let's put his picture up for a mass, unbelievable story. A Johnson County, Arkansas sheriff was arrested on Saturday for speeding and possession of drugs and firearms. His name is Sheriff Jimmy Stevens, 57 years of age, was pulled over by Arkansas State Troopers for speeding when they found him to be in possession of firearms and drugs at the traffic stop. Reportedly, Stevens had previously told constituents he planned to lead through responsible actions. Stevens, a Republican, was elected in 2019 and reelected in May with 62% of the vote. According to the Fort Smith Times, Stephen was booked into the Crawford County Detention Center on Saturday night. An Arkansas State Police spokesman said he was later released on a $25,000 bail. He is actually expected in court today. Let me give you what's available as it relates to his charges. Not a whole lot. It seems as if they went out of their way to try to protect some of the police narrative against him. A jailer said Sunday, Stevens was booked at 8.46 p.m. Saturday on three complaints of possession of a controlled substance and one complaint of speeding. Bill Sattler, the state police spokesman stated, and I quote, Arkansas State Police conducted a traffic stop earlier today and arrested Sheriff Stevens on charges of simultaneously possession of firearms and drugs. Now I have a question here because Arkansas, they're not being transparent about exactly what happened. What kind of guns can a sheriff have where it is illegal to possess them? What's the context here? How did they know that the sheriff had drugs in the vehicle? Was the sheriff high at the time? Is that what prompted the stop? And search, because keep in mind at some point, this became a fourth amendment situation, search and seizure. Well, you must have a good reason. You gotta have reasonable suspicion and then to affect the arrest, probable cause. There's a lot of information missing here as to the cause and effect of how all of this went down. Um, Let's put up. The Johnson County Sheriff elect Jimmy Stevens profile. The simultaneous possession charge, all right, that's actually a felony. In a post made in 2018 on his campaign's Facebook page, the sheriff listed out a series of promises to the people if they were to elect him as their sheriff. One point listed said, and I quote, I pledge to hold myself as well as all employees to the highest level of professional conduct and morality. Stevens also said he believed it is imperative that a proactive approach be taken when dealing with criminal behaviors. Well, damn, all right, you should have locked yourself up, Sheriff. We got more on the other side is indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these comments. Um, oh, this is funny. Uh, Craig Craig Souffle with the picture of a Paw Patrol badge and Herschel Walker says, hey, I can flash my badge too. It's, it's ironic because Herschel Walker actually did that according to a police report. Uh, he got pulled over by the real police 
And this man had the audacity to tell the real police that he was in fact the police too. It's on the police report. Did Herschel Walker get arrested for impersonating a cop? No, why? Because he's Herschel Walker, right? But he kind of did that. Stop Dragon says, Doc, please say it ain't so. A police chief abusing their authority? No. Yeah, he is. Chaz, Chaz reborn. Where's the sheriff? Smile now. Yeah. Okay. Um, A directive for. If camera was off, she would have asked, You know who the hell I am. That's right. It would have been a little different, the tone. Okay. Um, it's a damn shame. Discrimination in Africa against black folk in Africa. Here it is. Just a soldier, my brother. Hey, bro, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. No, 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 no. You could just relax. Just relax. Happening? What? Did it out of nowhere? I said you can't come in here. Don't touch me. I called the police. Don't touch me, brother. Don't touch me. I have more video and significant background to what you just saw out of Cape Town, South Africa. Put up the pictures full mass here. Now, what you're looking at is a white male who is standing up. For a black male who has been refused entry into a bar unless he comes with a white person. That's the only way he is able to attend the bar. The altercation started when Christopher Logan, a friend of the black victim here, his name is Thabiso Danka, is seen confronting the owner of Hank's old Irish pub after Mr. Danka was denied entrance into the establishment. Here's the altercation as it started. To tell you that it's not a calm situation. It's maybe calm for you because you don't give a because you think you have the right to tell whoever you want to come in, but you don't. It's a, you said on the phone, I have the right to tell whoever to I let in. I have, no, I you don't. Right. You don't have the right to discriminate in this country. It's a I crime. Have the right for reservation. If, uh, on the basis of race. To you. To you. Yes or no? To you. My brother, don't interrupt. This is what happened. Okay. This man right here, Fabiso, came in yesterday, okay? Right. Moments after Jordan came in. Moments after, okay? Your bouncer stopped him and said, why are you going in? Who are you going into? Okay. okay. He said, why are you asking me? He said, you can't come in here unaccompanied without a white person. He said, what? He said, you can't come in here without a white person. If you come in here, I know what you like. You steal, you guys cause trouble. You need to come in here with a white person. He asked him, who decides this? This is what the bosses have told me. Then Jordan, not knowing where Tabiso is, goes out and sees the bouncer re-explain this and says it to him again. And says it's not me who decides, it's the policy. Now I'm sure if this had to get out, there's a lot more people that have experienced this. It's a damn shame, the audacity of caucasity. This is in Cape Town, South Africa. There's more video. This is firstly a crime. I'm not done speaking. When I'm done, I'll give you an opportunity. It's firstly a crime in this country. Do you know where you exist? You exist in South Africa. Where we have a deeply painful history of Secondly, this will blow up an institution like hands. You're known. You're not somewhere in the middle of nowhere. You can't be doing this. You will become like clicks overnight. You have protesters outside your door. Let's see for the action. Good. So let's solve the apology. Look him in the eyes and apologize. I'm, I'm, I am. I'm deeply sorry about that. I don't think you did what you're saying. You came in saying you've never had it before. You have a policy. Maybe you need to make a. This is what's going to happen, okay? I'm going to tell you. You've got a few options here. You decide to either try and make the situation right, deal with it in a serious way, or we're going to walk out the door, go to the police, go to the press, and make a storm out of this. And I will rededicate my life to dealing with this. 
Way to go to the ally there. Uh, very proud of obviously the advocacy and the relationship um, between both of the individuals. Um, but here's reality, it should not happen. That should not, that should not be a thing. South Africa of all places. Um, they ended up attacking a white male for his advocacy, his righteous defense of his friend. And then they released a statement. Let me read this statement. We as owners have never discriminated, nor will we ever instruct our staff to discriminate on any basis whatsoever. On the basis of gender, sexual orientation or race. We want to place on record that we are extremely concerned for the well being and safety of the staff, the staff involved. Therefore, we will not be commenting any further while we conduct an internal disciplinary process about these allegations and the police conduct, conduct, excuse me, their criminal investigation. Okay, um, let's put up the two friends. In a statement, they say an internal investigation is underway on the matter. But they also say a case of assault against both of them has now been opened. Wow, racism is a global dynamic. Racism is a pervasive evil. So kudos to those who fight it wherever they see it. And it takes a lot of courage to advocate against evil, but we support you. All right, we'll continue to follow the story as it develops, all right? Okay, um, I got a question for everybody. What in the red state hell? You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face, it's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now, what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math, so I'm gonna say amen. Herschel has said, he said in a book that he has multiple personality disorder, but he's beaten it, he's cured it. Doctors say that there's no cure to that. Um, I'm talking about voting for somebody, sending them to Washington to be a senator uh, with that malady. Does that give you pause at all? No, not at all, not at all. I mean, I can't believe in Pennsylvania they voted for Fetterman and he's a lot worse off. Uh, we, you know, I can't believe they voted for Fetterman. I'm a Bulldog fan. I've seen Herschel play twice, play Georgia Tech two years in a row. And uh, anybody that don't vote for Herschel should never be allowed to say, go dogs ever again. So it's right. about the football for you? No, it's, no, it's about he's a man that believes the same way I do. I've heard him speak several times. He's an incredible person. Yeah, he had some stumbles and he addresses it and he learned from it. And he says God uses him uh, and built him from that. But um, I, I am 100% behind him. The hell is going on. All right, uh, once again, obviously Herschel Walker will not face any condemnation from those who are supporting him in the Republican Party as he is trying to become a United States Senator. Now keep in mind, they said things like President Obama was the Antichrist. They call Raphael Warnock the current US Senator. They say he is ungodly. And not a man of the cloth. But Herschel Walker, he has some missteps, but he's overcome them. What's happening here? It's called indoctrination. This happens in a cult activity all the time. When a person is in a cult, what they tend to do is stretch their moral compass in order to never challenge the person they are actually supporting. So they don't have to worry about criticizing Herschel. They can just change their position at will. Meaning they have no identifiable value system. Other than, as I said before, power. That's it, power. All right, that's it. Remember, take care of yourself, 
take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable.